Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach. And Colleen Quigley joins the show to talk about cross-training to an Olympic qualification, a U.S. Olympic team, and how cross-training maintains an ongoing role in her regular running Mm -hmm. training, even when she's not injured. Mm Mm-hmm. It was great to catch up with Colleen and what she's up to and hear from her and her holistic approach to running in life as well. Stick around after that for the latest from the world of running, including a U.S. high school record or two, an Australian champion, and the Paris Marathon. And make sure that you go to a to z dot com both for the extra tidbits of videos that we're going to link to from races that we'll discuss, as well as Look for the word follow because that's where the good stuff happens. Well, (laughs) that's where more of the good stuff happens. It's all good stuff, really. But you can also it's all good. (laughs) It's all you can also find us on the places where you like to find things. So if you're listening to podcasts, we're on all those. If you're watching, then we're on YouTube. And if you like the social media connection, we're some of those places too. Yeah. And we love to hear from you. In fact, last week was such a fun episode. It was another listener Q&A. We talked about racing shoes, dead butt, drills, fun stuff. And I did a survey afterwards about shoes on Instagram, and there was a lot of great results. And I'll make sure I share those on Instagram and stories as well. But there are so many different footwear options out there and some of us use them some of us don't some of them some of us run in trainers for marathons for instance because we want to make sure that we have the stability we need well a couple of fascinating items to know over half of you think that super shoes are here to stay and that you've embraced them and over 60 percent of you say that you do ankle and foot exercises which warmed my heart that's very impressive guys over 60 mm-hmm. percent that is good yeah and if you don't Add them to your regimen. <laughs> yeah, Do it's a it. good idea. It's a very good idea to maintain health. Speaking of good things to help you maintain that health, if you haven't checked it out before, the Mobo Board Ooh, yeah. is one of those tools mm-hmm. that can change the game and it makes it easier for you because they also provide with all of their material. This is free. You don't have to buy their board to find this stuff. But um, they have a YouTube channel where they have series of exercises and it's like five things, you know, it's simple, five things that you can do with their board to really up your game, especially mm-hmm. with things like foot and ankle stability. Yeah. We have a code. We do have a code. Do you know it is he running 10 to get 10% off your own mobile board if you would like one. I'll link to that and I'll double check his work on that. <laughs> she but I believe, believe that that's the code. She too. doesn't believe me that I remember off the top of my head. Yeah. My mind that is wasn't like a planned. steel trap. Things well, never leave it. I don't doubt you, but I I will put it at a to z running dot com as well. Well, let's with get that, on. let's get started. Our main topic today is cross training, and whether you're injured or not, it can be a great addition to your training regardless. And our guest today, Colleen Quigley, shares her incredible journey, which. Spoiler alert, includes cross training before she made the Olympic team in 2016 in Rio. So a little about our guest, Colleen Quigley. She's an Olympian, as I mentioned, and she joins us today to discuss her journey. And in a few minutes, you're going to hear more about it. But here are a few of Colleen's accolades. Colleen is a professional runner with notable sponsors such as Lululemon, Whoop, Hyper Ice, which Whoop. they make uh, Norma Tech. And those are just a few of many. In addition to running, Colleen is a volunteer assistant coach. She does race commentary, modeling, has a degree in dietetics, and she founded the trend Fast Braid Friday. So those are just many hats that she wears. It's like nobody else ever did Fast Braid Friday before. She made it a thing. Like it's a real thing. You wouldn't know. You don't have hair to braid. (laughs) Sorry, Zach. And then some running highlights. She's an Olympian, a national champion. She went to Florida State University. She was fifth at the NCAAs as a freshman 
which is incredible. In 2015, she was the NCAA 3000 meter steeplechase champion. She was eighth at the 2016 Rio Olympics. And there are so many other things I could share, but I do want to note that she, in 2019, was the national champion in the one mile. Mm -hmm. And she also has been the champion in the Fifth Avenue mile. Hi, Colleen. Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast. How's it going? It's going good here. We're so excited for you as you're you're getting back into the thick of it. Um, First of all, how are you doing? Do you want to catch us up? Yeah, yeah. I a lot of life changes. Um, I bought a house in Flagstaff, Arizona, last fall, or the, just like this past fall. Um, Congrats! So doing things. It's really exciting. I've been doing a lot of training up here um, at seven thousand feet, which is challenging, um, but so good for me. Um, and then I'm headed back down to sea level uh, in a few days. Um, my second home base, so I've, you know, like kind of an altitude home base and a sea level home base. So my sea level home base will be LA going forward. So I'll get to spend the month of April there, which will be really fun and um, warm and sunny. Um, and then back up here again before USA. So yeah, I just kind of go back and forth. It's only a seven hour drive. Um, so I can bring the, the car and the dog and the fiance and all that every time I kind of go back and forth. Yeah, well, congratulations on the engagement. I should have let off with that too. So that's exciting, another part of life to celebrate. Totally, yeah. Kevin and I have been together for 12 years, so definitely we're always just like, yeah, one day we're going to get married, you know. Um, But it never felt like um, a rush. But then once it did happen, it did surprisingly feel different. Like it felt like this feels good. Like, uh, I don't know. I I didn't expect it to feel any different, and it did in a good way. So it's been fun. Awesome. Well, that's another exciting thing to look forward to. Well, today's topic with you, Colleen, is cross training. And you are the queen. There is no like perfect, more perfect person to talk (laughs) about this topic with. So I guess we'll dive right in. You want to take us to 2015 and just like start start your story from there? Yeah, that's definitely when I first started cross training for real, for real. Um, was when I turned pro, I did like a little bit of aqua jogging in high school. I had like one minor injury in high school. Um, and so I kind of like learned what aqua jogging was uh, the winter before my senior year of high school and then didn't touch it again until um, 2015 when I got injured before the trials. Um, and I just like, yeah, I had a few different injuries that I just couldn't shake. And so um, you know, going crazy, not being able to run, not being able to work out. And so aqua jogging, and then that's so boring that I just wanted to die. So I learned how to swim. Um, and I was just, I would like go to the pool and like the lifeguard, ask the lifeguards to give me pointers. Like, I'd be like, can you watch me and tell me what I'm doing wrong? Um, and so they would give me a pointer or two and I would practice that for a few days. And then I would ask for, okay, I think I'm better at that. Like I need another another one. And so I developed like, I only know how to like freestyle, just like front, you know, regular swimming is the only thing I do. And I still for the life of me cannot flip turn. Um, But I always just I'm a big proponent of getting in the water whenever you're injured. I think it's there's healing properties to the water. Um, You know, most any injury you can still do some kind of swimming or aqua jogging because there's absolutely no impact. And it just, yeah, it's such a good all round like workout for your whole body. And I think it's also just a great skill to have that, you know, you can swim um, your whole life. Like even when you're really old and maybe can't run anymore, you will be able to still swim. So I think it's just like a good life skill to have. And so I'm, yeah, I'm always a big proponent of that. Um, And I started calling it in 2015, I started calling it mermaiding instead of swimming to make it sound more fun and exciting than like going to the pool to go swimming. I was like, I'm going to go be a mermaid um, for a little while, (laughs) which is just a mind game, which is very important. So um, swimming or biking, I do a decent amount of cycling um, as well. And then some elliptico um, or ellipticaling. So I do it all. And I, yeah, I just, I definitely am a big proponent of it, both physically to like keep your aerobic endurance up and like give you, you know, you're like, feel like you're working towards your goals, but just, yeah, like mentally to have you feel like you're doing something. You're not just like sitting there waiting for your body to heal and feeling hope like helpless and 
you know, like you're not progressing. Um, it gives you that feeling of like, Oh, I'm still working hard. I'm still like, you know, progressing towards my goals. Um, and you get like those happy endorphins from working out. And I think when you are injured and you don't have that, um, yeah, it's so, I mean, injury for so many reasons is so tough mentally, but I honestly think one of the biggest things is that you don't get those endorphins that you get from, you know, from working out. So, um, anytime, uh, or any way that you can get those, I always, you know, I'm a big proponent of that. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that you brought up that it's such a, the mental piece is such a big part of that for us as runners and being driven as well and having these goals that for you was not that far out. I like how FlowTrack put it, it was like 10 weeks to Olympic trials yeah. in an article about you. Can you talk us through, I guess, that element of it? Like having this big goal that was coming up in the very near future and then being in the pool when you want to be out running with your team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so injury is so isolating, right? You feel like you're just on an Island and you're in the pool or on the bike. Like I was always at the gym. I was cross training like crazy as probably cross training too much. Looking back, I've definitely gone down that hole of just like becoming obsessed with it and doing it because I'm fearful of becoming like getting out of shape or putting on weight which I think is not definitely not like, I'll be the first one to admit definitely not healthy. Um, But yeah, it's just like such a mental challenge to have what you love and what you dedicate for professionals, at least what do you like dedicate your life to um, is in jeopardy or has been temporarily, you know, taken away. Um, And it just feels like a, it feels like you're the only one going through it. You like really feel like you're alone, which is, obviously not the case, but that is um, a lot of people will say that they just feel like super alone. Um, and B, it just feels like it's never going to end. You're like, I will never get healthy again. I'm never going to be able to, you know, feel strong and pain-free again for, for me, at least it always just feels like I'm, I just can't imagine like my hip not hurting or whatever. Um, and it, of course it does stop hurting, but in that moment, it just seems so permanent and seems so lonely. Um, and so that, you know, the, the cross training for sure, but also the mental health, um, working on your mental health, working on your physical health, and then working on your mental health, um, in tandem is so important. And you, you really need to do both. You can't just do one. Um, you have to be able to say, okay, I have to attack this thing from like two sides. Um, because I think even when you get healthy again, if you didn't kind of address the, um, mental part of it. I think it just, you know, kind of causes more issues um, where it's more likely to kind of follow you the rest of your, you know, career. So, um, yeah, it's totally, it's a pronged approach for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it and it does feel like so long when you're in it and you do think like, is this ever going to end? So can you talk us through practically like those 10 weeks? What did it look like Mm. for you before the Uh Olympic trials? I mean, I was cross training when I wasn't running, I was cross training like two or three hours a day, either on the pool bike or elliptical. Um, Now I wouldn't really recommend that to anyone. It was pretty like legit crazy. Um, And I don't actually don't do that anymore. I've been injured plenty of times since then. And I just don't, yeah, I don't think that was healthy. Um, But I was just trying to keep up my aerobic, you know, endurance as much as I could. And then as soon as I was able to get back to running, we ramped, I mean, we ramped things up pretty quickly. Um, I just didn't have time to like be super conservative. Um, And luckily, um, the last thing that I was dealing with was like a bone injury, which honestly is more like clear cut sometimes where it's like when the bone is healed and it's ready to take on stress, you can kind of like go for it there's plenty of injuries where like tendon stuff or, you know, like plantar fasciitis and it's, it can be so tricky with like um, Achilles issues. Like it just doesn't, it's not that it just goes away or that it's healed. You know, it's this continuous process and it takes sometimes years um, before you might not feel any pain anymore. So at least for me at that time, it was a bone injury and I was like, okay, my hip bone is healed. Now I gave it the time it needed to heal. So I could have like that confidence to just go after training without wondering if it was okay, or if it was healed. Um, and that's kind of the best case scenario, even though it's like, you don't want a broken bone, but I mean, you know, and the scheme of things, 
I felt like that was the best case scenario. Um, so we ramped up things pretty quickly. It had only like probably a couple of steeple workouts before um, the trials. And then I think the biggest thing looking back that probably gave me the most confidence was I did. Um, I hadn't raced since world championships the summer before. Um, and so I needed like a rust buster race. So I went to the Portland track. No, it wasn't Portland track fest. It was the Stumptown twilight or Portland twilight or something. One of those Portland pre trials meets that Portland hosts. Um, and it was a 1500. So I didn't do the steeple, but I did 1500 and it was an opportunity for me to spike up and run faster than my steeple race pace, but just like more than anything, put the Jersey on again and like compete. I remember what that feels like. Cause when you've been out of it for so long, you know, workouts just can only do so much to simulate what a race is. So to like, just get a little rust buster in. Um, and I remember that race so clearly because um, it was raining because it was in Portland, of course. And um, I, the race got out really hot and I went straight to the back. I like right off the, off the line, I just found myself in the dead last back of the race. And I was like, you know, curse word. I was like, Oh God, I'm screwed. Like, this is not good. Um, and I just felt like everyone was sprinting and I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, run fast. And I was like, Oh, this is going to be ugly. Um, but then like, I just kind of kept going. I like tried to stay calm and I just kept going and people started dying. Um, and I've been training at altitude. And so I, you know, that third lung kicked in around, I don't know, thousand meters or whatever it wherever it was and i was like i'm doing okay like i'm actually feeling pretty strong and people were dying because i think they went out sprinting and they started to pay for it and so the last like 300 meters i went from like second to last to first um and i won the race and i was like whoa like that and a it was so fun to like win a race again and like even just compete again and you know just gird it out i'm there's like a picture of me like getting to the finish line with like my ugly grit face and after all that time injured from all fall all winter and like most of the spring just to be able to put the jersey on and spike up again and compete and then get a win it was um I think that was probably the confidence booster that I needed going into the trials to just be like you know even if I don't make the team like I belong to be here like you know I can compete even if you know that's not top three today it was like I can you know, be in a position to actually compete for a spot. I'm not going to go and finish last. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was a big deal. And I think, you know, a lot, like I said, confidence or uh, the mental part of like being injured is also like getting that confidence and getting the mental part right again, when you're healthy to like just full send, you know, Molly said all style full send, go for it. Um, and like, don't hold back or be afraid um, that your body is not going to do what you want it to do. Um, and so I think, yeah, having that experience under my belt before going into the trials was probably clutch, very key. Mm -hmm. We've talked about steeple chase. Well, we've had a couple steeple chasers, chasers on the show and most recently Bernard Keeter, and he was talking about the mental game having to be especially strong in the steeple chase. Yeah. So how was that for you? Because you hadn't, I'm guess I'm guessing you hadn't done all the same kind of steeple training that you would have done if you were right. healthy. So how right. was that leading into the trials? Yeah, the, you know what I really leaned on then, and I've leaned on it a few times since being injured and coming back is um, my time at Florida State. Because when I was a freshman at Florida State, my coach um, Karen Harvey was like she had actually told me when she recruited me that she wanted me to run the steeple, and I had never done you know, hurdles in high school. I never thought about doing the steeple. And so we had to start from ground zero on teaching me how to hurdle. Um, and so she brought in a hurdle coach who, um, was still living in Tallahassee, but had retired. He had been coached, he coached, um, 400 meter hurdlers back, back in the day. Um, his name is Terry Long and he coached me and taught me how to hurdle like from nothing, from the absolute basics for months and months. We just did drills before I was even allowed to jump over a hurdle. So, um, and we did all these drills, like three-step drills where he would line up like 10 hurdles along the hundred. And I would take three steps in between 
between each one, which is like a sprint hurdle drill that I don't think any steeplechasers really do. Um, but he was adamant that I like really, you know, and he, we would watch a video together. He would, he would take video of me while doing that. And then we would watch it back in slow-mo and dissect it and figure out, you know, how I could be better. Um, and he was just, yeah, adamant that I knew how to hurdle properly. And I was, you know, really strong, um, as a hurdler. Um, and then coach Harvey made sure I was strong as a runner. And so uh, even if I couldn't practice those hurdles for that year, that basically that I was injured, I knew that I had such a good foundation that it would be like riding a bike. That I'd be like, I remember my body will remember how to do that. I definitely need to do some before the race just to like wake up those like you know, muscles again and were like, remind myself how to do it. But I just felt so confident in my like training from those four years at Florida state that I was like, it's going to be like riding a bike. I'll remember, you know, how to hurdle. Mm -hmm. And that positivity, that space that you remember in such a great way and having that team supporting you back then. That's so true that there are things that we are afraid of that we've done before where we need to hit maintain the confidence that yeah. we've built that neuromuscular connection you know we have those pathways and we could we could do this again so thank yeah. you for sharing that um mm -hmm. so then i i would be remiss not to ask you like about the race itself my audience would be like kicking me for not asking you about that race what are some things you want to tell us from the race itself for that olympic trials oh yeah from the trials yeah um I think the biggest thing I remember from that day is like all the crap I had been through, you know, all the teary phone calls to my parents being like, what am I doing? Like, I wanted to be a professional runner. I didn't want to be a professional injured person. Like, all I'm doing, you know, here is swimming. And like, you know, I, I moved to a new city. I have a new coach, a new team. And all of a sudden, like, I just can't get healthy. Um and I, I really thought at that time that I had one shot at the Olympics and that um, I would retire, I would not, I mean, can you even call it retirement if you do it for a year? I would like move on from running after the Olympics in 2016. I, I just thought I would do it for a year and try and make the team. And if I did, great. And if I didn't, at least I tried and I would move on. So I was like, you know, this is not how I wanted to spend the year. I can't even prepare. I was super stressed out. And then right before like the race, by the time I got to Eugene, um, my whole family was there, my parents and my brother and my sister. And I just remember like kind of being, I mean, I was still nervous, but I, I kind of like just figured out and I had never done any mental coaching at the time. So I don't know how I did this, um, but I just like had figured out to like how to let go of the expectation or like let go of the result, I think. Um, and I was just remembering that my parents and brother all had the goal um, of making the Olympic trials. They were, they were all runners. Uh, my brother ran professionally for a little bit and um, my mom got close, but then got pregnant. My dad was trying to make it in the marathon. And then my brother was trying to go in the five. Well, he ran the steeple and then the 5k um, and then had a bunch of injury issues. So um, they, none of them ever made, you know, was able to realize that goal of going to the Olympic trials. And so for us as a family, it was like, I'd almost already won because I was there. I was at the trials, I was competing. And I think that helped just to like be more appreciative of that opportunity. And just like that in and of itself is an accomplishment. And, you know, even if I didn't make the team that year, um, they were, they were all going to be super proud and happy for me either way. Um, so I think that was probably like a large part of how I was able to find that sense of calm. But I remember like being on the starting line and like they, you know, they go through and they announce everyone. Um, and they said my name and they said I was a national champion. And I remember like waving to the crowd and I don't think I saw my family cause it's just, it was, you know, so many people, but, um, I remember the crowd, like, you know, cheering when, when I, uh, when they said my name and I was just like, was kind of having fun. I just felt like this is exciting. This is fun. And I didn't feel like that sense of like, dread or like um overwhelming nerves because nerves are good and i always talk about like being nervous is a good thing but like like debilitating nerves um you know is not not so not good not productive i was like good nervous and um yeah and then the race kind of played out to the point where 
um, the last K it was like one K to go. And Emma did what Emma does. And she just like broke away from the pack and started breaking down the pace pretty quickly. And I remember I'm making that decision, like in the moment of like, well, here's the race, like, are you going or you're not? <laughs> and I decided to go, I was like, you know, F it. Um, you know, I want to like try and just like see if I, what I can do here. And so Stephanie Garcia went with Emma and then I went after Stephanie and it became the, the three of us that like strung out to be the three of us. Um, and then the final lap was really exciting because um, Stephanie was, was fading and Courtney Furrix, my, like a year later became my teammate um, or I guess that summer she became my, became my teammate was coming behind me, um, but I didn't know that. And so at the water pit, Courtney and I kind of overtook Steph, Stephanie Garcia right after the, the final water pit with like 110 meters to go, we overtook her. Um, and we ended up, um, Courtney was second and I ended up third. And I just remember like going down that home stretch, not even knowing that I made the team yet. Like the pictures are so funny because my face, like Courtney's face is so happy because she realizes like she's going to the Olympics. And my face is like, I hurt so bad everywhere in my body that I am just like tunnel vision to get to the finish line. I can't even think about what that means yet. I just need to like cross the finish line. Um, and then when I crossed the finish line, then it was like, oh my, you know, then you like realize, and then you don't hurt at all anymore because you're so happy. It all goes away. <laughs> but yeah, it was extremely painful. I pushed my body to a point where I didn't know if it was going to hold up. Like I, I was unsure if I was going to be able to, you know, hold that pace. But um, I think, you know, Olympics only come around every four years. You have to, sometimes you just got to send it, take a risk and like see what happens. Um, and so, yeah, I think having an experience like that is really good because then um, it almost like teaches or like teaches you, shows you that you can do that. And um, of course, it's not going to always turn out like you might definitely are probably definitely going to blow up if at some point if you do that every time. Um, but it's always like, you know, always worth a shot, um, especially when it's like, a you know, all or nothing situation, like either you make the team or you don't like you might as well try. So yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great memory for me. Thanks for asking yeah. me to relive it. Yeah. Well, it's so exciting. I'm like super excited right now. So everybody who's <laughs> listening, if you're running right now and it's supposed to be an easy day, like back yeah. off, you're <laughs> probably running a little too fast because we're all geeked to be hearing about that. And then you go into the Olympic games and you make an Olympic final. Let's, let's, let's keep going with this. And, um, did you do any cross training in the interim? What was it like then rebounding and then preparing for the Olympics? Um, yeah, I stayed pretty healthy. Actually, I didn't really have to do much cross training. I do um, now. So after that kind of like set of injuries, I built in cross training into my regular program. So um, it used to be that I would be injured and I'd be cross training and I'd be healthy and I'd be running. But then after that, I said, okay, maybe I need to like make it a combo deal and do definitely um, like a decent amount of cross training. And so in the afternoons, instead of doing a second run, like when the rest of the team would go do a second run, I would sometimes second run, but I would mostly get in the pool or get on the bike and do a non-impact, um, you know, second run, <laughs> quote unquote, second run. Uh, and I think that also has been a really good balance for me to keep, um, keep the workload up, but keep like the stress on my body a little bit lower um, and try and, you know, instead of, an all or nothing, either running or cross training, just keep a nice balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Implementing it into your regular routine. Now that's something that not a lot of runners do because we just love to run and it's so yeah. hard <laughs> to change it up. And things like injury though, can push us into a new part of ourselves. Like you are, you found your mermaid and mermaid was born. Um, Absolutely. And, and then we have this, this richness that can come along with that and then allow for it to physically give us an advantage because it's keeping us from some of the pounding for those second runs like you were talking about. I think that's a super valuable, tangible takeaway for our audience. You know, if we are injury prone to be supplementing with cross training on the regular. So you said you, would, you do swimming, biking, elliptigo, and elliptical. Uh, what does that look like? for you and how do you choose which one to do? Gosh, I mean, it depends honestly on like 
how I'm like feeling. Sometimes I get into these moods where I'm like really into the bike. Um, and so I, you know, I might only bike for cross training for like a couple of weeks. That's just like how I, you know, maybe I'm really into, um, I don't know, to Peloton. Um, or sometimes I'm, I have access to an outdoor pool and that's, you know, ha- making me happy. It's really like, what do I like dread the least? What do I feel like, um, you know, is going to be the most fun? Uh, you're most likely to do it if, you know, if you think it's fun, um, anytime I can get outside. So that's why like the elliptigo can be really fun. Cause then I can go outside on a road and be in the sunshine. And that's a lot better than, you know, being in the you know, basement pool at a crappy gym. So I'd I'd much rather do that. Uh, Or it depends on the weather too. Like if I can't go outside, then maybe the pool or the stationary bike is going to be the best thing. Um, One thing I'll I'll leave people with is that I have found this trick that um, I correlate um, a behavior that I, you know, maybe don't necessarily look forward to, which might be cross training. And I combine it with something that I want to do, which for me can be like um, watching Netflix or like watching whatever, if it's like a Netflix show or um, like trash TV or something that I don't want to spend my time doing when I could be doing something productive. But if I have to be on the bike anyway, then I'll treat myself to like binging on that whatever Anna show that everyone's watching. Um, And so that, you know, in my head, then it becomes like a treat. So I get to go and get on the bike. It's a, it's a psychological thing. Like this, like scientists have figured this out, that this is really helpful for, um, building habits. And so I, yeah, I treat myself to something like Netflix when I'm on the bike or on the elliptical or something. Um, and so, yeah, that can be a good trick for people too. And you can't do it outside of your cross training. You can't watch the show if you're not doing the cross training. So hopefully that helps folks. (laughs) I love that. That's excellent. Well, Colleen, it's been amazing to have the queen of cross training on our show. (laughs) The queen of so many things, but uh, especially with a lot of our audience being able to relate to this part of training and staying and being healthy. So thank you so much, Colleen. Yeah. And we just remember the cross training, but also you know, you have the two pronged, maybe you need a combo of cross training and therapy or cross training and meditation or cross training and breathing exercises. Um, yeah, we're, we're whole human beings. So we got to, mm-hmm. uh, address the mental and physical side. Mm-hmm. Oh, so important. Thank you so much, <laughs> Colleen. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks to Colleen Quigley for sharing her time with us here on the show today. I want to highlight that amazing suggestion that she had of adding something that you love to your cross training. Something that I do is I invite a friend or a buddy to do it with me because there's somebody usually who would like to get some extra cross training in. So reach out to your friends. You can tune up that uh, Netflix show, maybe queue up the A to Z running podcast. So add something you enjoy with that cross training to make it more fun, more desirable for you to do. And I wanted to give a couple cross training suggestions since we've talked on the show about these specifically. So like aqua jogging, we had a whole episode about it. We have an article about it. What's great about aqua jogging is that there is zero impact. So it's really great for a lot of injuries, like Colleen actually said in the episode as well. The only problem with aqua jogging is that it's hard to build fitness. If you're like already at a very, uh, if you're at a high fitness level, it's hard to add more fitness. But it is great for maintaining and it's awesome for recovery. Mm. So if you need to get recovery miles in and you're feeling a little niggle, aqua jogging would be a great option for you. And again, like it can help you maintain fitness really, really well. But it's not an excellent option if you don't have water. So (laughs) for many, a more feasible option is the bike. And Mm -hmm. of course, there's lots to accomplish with biking for runners. We've talked about this before in many different instances. You should definitely check out the episode with Todd, Todd Buckingham, if you haven't already listened to that one, because he, being 
you know, an avid cyclist, and highly Dr. accomplished, Todd, yes. <laughs> um, and as well expertise in physiology. And so being able to talk about for runners, what should we try to do when we're trying to gain gains from biking? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a good conversation. But also it's important to think about like, I need, I need equipment that can be the thing I need in the way I need it. So like if you got to set up in your basement, um, can you put your bike on a trainer or do you have a stationary bike of some kind? You know, those kinds of things. Many people have better access to things like bikes. Um, the thing to remember with biking is that anatomically, it's not doing the same thing with the same kinds of muscles as running. And so there's many who talk about biking as like, ah, I didn't feel like running today. So I was going to bike instead. Um, it just take care. Because biking is not a one-to-one replacement for running, mm-hmm. but it is a great option when you need to cross train. It's great for fitness. Run. It's and, great and, for fitness. In aqua jogging, I did want to mention it's good near muscularly. So if ah, you combine yes. those two, if you're not able to run and you're able to do some aqua jogging and some biking, the combo of those two is going to be more effective for you. Now, swimming. Zach and I don't know a whole lot about swimming. Because I can't. <laughs> he sinks. Um but we think that swimming is excellent. And uh, Colleen, that's one of her go-to ways to cross train. And so I am linking to her website with some of those workouts. But I did some research of my own. And there are there's research that supports that swimming-based recovery sessions enhance the following day of exercise and performance. So that's something to consider, especially when you're looking at getting some recovery in between your sessions. And of course, swimming can grow your cardiovascular endurance as well as strengthen your body without the pounding. So those are some really great options for you if you're not able to run. But also what I love that Colleen says is she keeps it as part of her program. And before things happen, she's able to use cross training to add to her training in a great way. So I'm going to be looking to do that uh, after I'm finished with this injury that I've got going on. And um, I know that Zach has used a bike quite a bit, and we use our Zero Runner in our home. Zero Runner is another... Elliptical type of machine. Yeah, it's an elliptical type of machine. So we would love to hear from you, your thoughts about cross-training. You guys are always such an engaging audience. So if you have more questions about it or you'd like to hear more, hit us up. That would be awesome. Another thing that would be awesome is learning what's new in the world of running. So let's get on to that. First, in the world of running, let's give a quick shout out to A to Z runner Aaron, who ran a half marathon personal best. Congrats, Aaron. Which is excellent and finished second place as well in the race, which is wonderful. Run Bentonville half marathon. Bentonville. Excellent. Nice job, Aaron. Great race. Yeah, way to go. Now, if, uh, if if we can start kind of on a somber note here, um, just acknowledging some tragic running news that has happened just recently. Um, this from Tennessee, I believe, is where the school is. But Milligan, which is an NAIA school, um, had five of their men, actually it was four of their guys and an assistant coach or a coach, I believe, running together when they were hit by a driver under the influence. And three of them were hit one died and the other two in varying degrees of mm. injury. Mm. So terrible. Terrible and tragic. And we know these things happen and it's, you know, it's it's always a keen reminder that it does happen. We as runners need to do everything we can to try to be safe and we as drivers need to mm. not do things like that. Mm. So sad, so tragic. That it is. So shout out, hearts go out to the Milligan crew and what they're having to deal with so right awful. now. So yeah. Well, we're going to change gears and go to some more running news. Uh, There's another high school record that happened, and we've been talking a lot about high schoolers lately. What's up with that, Zach? (laughs) Well, it's because they're doing amazing things. Yeah, they're doing such great things. We'll talk about all of the people that are doing amazing things. Yeah. Yeah, so this is really exciting, and we've got the we've got the video of this race. There's a couple of them actually that we're going to note here, but the video of this race, if you want to watch it, which is always fun to be able to do. Yeah, and this is at the Stanford Invitational, which is one of the bigger track meets that yeah. happens in the United States at this time of year. So there's uh, the big track season tends to be late spring and then really summer is when like all the tracks have happened. So around this time of year, you want to be able to find some good meets if you're a college runner, especially because there's just not that many opportunities. And so the Stanford invite is one of those. And in this heat of the 5,000 meters, Natalie Cook, a high schooler from Flower Mound, Texas, 
ran third place overall against like all the great collegians some pro runners in the mix uh, to finish in a time of 1525 1525 in the 5000 so meters speedy. 1525 that is a new United States high school record as well as U20 5000 meter record for the US yeah that's, that's impressive very impressive wow so <laughs> props to Natalie Cook now, I should note as well, since we're talking about high schoolers doing crazy things, um, there was another uh, across the other side of the spectrum in the marathon, a new high school marathon record, which is, is kind of a thing. It's not really formally a thing because high schoolers don't race the marathon, so it's more like an age it's it, it's an age record, but we have a friend who did though. Yeah. Yes, I just mean in that like you can't compete in the marathon in a high school division. Right, <laughs> you compete <laughs> in school. age group divisions. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, um, so this is Tim Sinovic or something like that. Sinovic um, is what it looks like if if he's Eastern European descent. So from Salisbury, Maryland, he broke what was a forty nine year old U.S. high school marathon. That's a long standing record. record. Yeah, not many records stand that long anymore these days, and uh, and you can you can understand why this one does because high schoolers don't tend to train for the marathon. Yeah. Um, whether he was training for it or not, though, he ran two twenty one fifty. Sorry, sorry, two twenty two fifty one. Yep. And he Any won time? the race, by the way. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So yes, in his hometown, in the Salisbury oh, that's marathon. Cool. Fun. He'll be All legendary right. there. <laughs> legendary. Okay, Andy, number two. Oliver Hoare. Let's jump the, all the way across yeah. the opposite side of the world. He won the Australian Open in the 1500 meters, and that's not a surprise. Uh, many of you who do follow Oliver Hoare, and we sure do here at the A to Z Running Podcast. We've had him on the show before. On Athletics Club. And it, yeah, he's part of the crew. I'm linking, well, I'm actually able to embed the video of this performance, which was fun to watch because you got to see Oliver's tactics. We talked to him on the show about his racing season. Um, so it's fun to see like him in his racing season. And it, the first lap, he's like holding back a bit. You could tell he's, tell he's chomping at the bit. And it went out slow. It was like 61, 62, which is slow for them. I know it's like but fast for most of us. For him. <laughs> and then he ended up taking the lead by the second lap because he was just like, he couldn't he couldn't go that pace. It was too slow. And then um, he led the second lap. And by the third, he tested the rest of the field and only two were able to go with him. And... Uh, at the bell, the two others were still kind of hanging on. Mm. And in the final lap, he stretched it out, still having, you know, like a pretty the, – the second place guy, he did a pretty good job holding. But um, he won substantially to win his first national title. His so first congrats national to title. Ali. All right. Yeah. He's got some national records, but hadn't, right. hadn't run. Because of COVID. He's training right. in the United We've States. We've talked so. about this. So the main reason why Ali didn't have any national titles up until this one was because – the last couple of years as his pro career started was during all of the time when you know right. things like traveling to and from Australia from the U.S. was not really yeah. possible for a while there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, also it was an Olympic year, so, you know, he's there was that, that too. too. Yeah, you know, being an Olympian <laughs> and, and uh, stuff. And Diamond League races yep. and all of that. So, so anyway. he's just added another one of the notches sure. to the belt, you could yeah. say. He's got a national title now. He's been to the Olympics. He's got national records. Just Good things for circuit. Oliver Hoare. Great. Well, let's talk about now we're going to go like halfway across the world again, jump over to Europe because the Paris Marathon happened just recently. Mm -hmm. And there were some interesting results there. The Paris Marathon is not known to be an especially fast course. And so as a consequence, you don't tend to see people making record attempts at this event. Um, but that's not to say they don't happen. And when fast people run, they tend to run fast. So we get things like Profound, this. Zach. Profound, Zach. Yes. Uh, Profound. This is a good thing to remember. Um, all right. So in the men's race, uh, it was one of those. This has been happening. We keep saying this. This has been happening more lately than usual. Um, close finishes in yeah. a marathon, which is like awful. Yeah, you, there don't, was, you don't it, want this. I just saw this, and I don't know which one it was, but there's also a, an Iron Man that came down to a Oh, that's a even worse. Finish. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> Recently. I don't even want to talk yeah. about that. Okay, so this was a three-second gap from first to second, and they were really gunning home to try to take the win. And it was Deso Gamisa who won in a time of 205.07 over uh, his fellow Ethiopian, his countryman, uh, Seifu Tura. 
mm-hmm. who, by the way, was also a winner of the Chicago Marathon in just this past in 2021. So 205, 10. Only three seconds between <laughs> three the two seconds. of them. <laughs> well, and when it comes down to it in a situation like that, it's just who had who had the kick. Yeah. So at that point, it's not who can run a faster marathon because it they ran the they same. They ran most of the marathon. <laughs> they ran together. the same. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. That's awful and great at the same time. Yeah. But it should be noted that uh, behind them, not far behind them, in third place, Morhad Amdouni of France ran a French national record yeah. in 205.22. Very respectable national record. Absolutely. And took like a minute-ish off the previous record. And it was oh, in nice. Paris. So that's and, you just know, really hometown, cool. Hometown. Well, not hometown. I don't know where he actually lives, but home country. Yeah. So, yes, I think that's pretty always, neat when that happens. That's always cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, especially when when the race itself is not known to be a record setting race. So yeah. to be able to do that just shows. I mean, he's got to he's got to run something like that and think, hmm, if I did Boston next fall, I wonder if I could take another. Or sorry, not Boston, Berlin next fall. I wonder if I could take another minute yeah, off. Maybe. That time. Who knows? And speaking right. of taking minutes off, let's That's talk about it. the women's race. Judith Career Egyptum ran two nineteen forty eight for the women's win, taking almost three minutes okay. off of her personal best time, and she broke the course record by over a minute. Paris Marathon course record, 219.48, three-minute PR. That's quite a day. Yeah. And she is the first woman to run sub-220 on French roads. Ah, so not just a Paris Marathon course record, but a French all-comers record. All-comers record. I learned Uh, that was something new that I learned. I didn't know what all-comers records were until this episode. So I'm always learning something new, too. I don't think that Americans refer to it in the same way. Oh. And so it, it definitely in Europe, they talk about this a lot. Um, the all comers records is like who's run the fastest in that country. Uh-huh. Um, and so we call them soil records around uh, here. Yep. So we wouldn't necessarily say something like the Texas state all comers record. We would say the Texas state soil record. Yep. Um, but uh, Which I'm very whatever. familiar with. Yes. So we've talked about those kinds of things in the past. This is the French one then for the women's marathon. That's great. And to wrap up this part of the world of running conversation 10th place was Lindsay Flanagan of the USA we're always saying her name you know her as being the road racing she's what, always like what do they know her on the roads no <laughs> she, I know I started that without she, like coming up with a clever name yeah, for her but okay. Lindsay Flanagan is a rock star she's always there she's always in the mix I feel like I'm always saying her name on this show ha huh. So anyway, well, props sign. to Lindsey Flanagan for sticking her nose in there and getting a 10th place finish. Top 10 in, in a big marathon is always good. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, that's it for the moment in the world of running, but always more exciting things in the next round. So you definitely want to be the places where the content is. And in case (laughs) you aren't exactly sure where that is, we are certainly most easily found at adazyrunning.com. Make sure you look for the word follow if you haven't already done that there. And then if you like to watch the stuff, we're on YouTube. Yeah. If you like to get the kind of day-to-day more granular, here's some quick interesting ideas. Andy's great with Instagram, so you can always find us there too. We love connecting with you. That's one of our favorite things about A to Z running community because we want to help each other thrive. And the goal of A to Z running is to help runners thrive. And with that, and most importantly, if you need a little something more in your running journey and you're not getting it by information alone, certainly reach out or check us out at a to z running.com. Look for the word coaching, and we would love to talk more with you about your training. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>